Okay, students, so uh, this is my first attempt at trying to use what's called a screencast to do a little online lecture for you. So uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, probably have to do it in a couple of chunks because they limit to you to about 15 minutes. Um, anyway, starting out here in French Polynesia. Uh, I love talking about coral reefs because, of course, I think they're some of the most fascinating and beautiful ecosystems on the whole planet, which is partly why I'm doing some coral reef monitoring work in the Turks and Caicos Islands, and I can tell you guys uh, more about that sometime in class. Um, here in this uh, picture, where, where I don't work, <laughs> actually haven't been to the French Polynesia, but you can clearly see the reef in the um, in the water here, and um, it, it's it's pretty shallow. This is kind of a fringing reef here. I'll talk about more what that means a little bit. Obviously, the island. This is a volcanic island. Most of the islands in the Bahamas and the Turks and Caicos Islands. Um, in that part of the world, none of them actually are volcanic, and, and we can talk a little bit more about that later, too. But anyway, and here's a little map just to, here's Australia, New Zealand, French Polynesia. Keep going around <laughs> the globe, of course, obviously, you can keep going east to get to the west. Um, anyway, let's uh, talk a bit more about um, how coral reefs are formed. Um, here's an underwater picture of a beautiful reef. There are some hard corals right here, and over here, and over here, and over here. There's some brain coral. There's different kinds of corals. You'll probably also uh, notice that there's some other things growing on top of each other. There's some bryozoans. There's a little sponge in here. Obviously, a little bit of a, a cardinal fish over here. So uh, a reef is composed of a lot of different species of corals, as well as other organisms that live together in this really beautiful um, uh, interspecies mix. Um, and so <clears throat> coral reefs, um, one of the things that we might first notice about them is that they're um, incredibly biologically diverse. And uh, comparing this ecologically to a terrestrial ecosystem, you know when you look at a forest or even a, a lake, you see that there's a domination of green plants, right? You've got primary producers. And, and if we were in class, I would ask you the question, why is that? Well, of course, the, the answer is that at the base of food chains and food webs, we need to have photosynthetic, photosynthetic organisms, primarily, that are primary producers that feed uh, consumers, uh, both uh, protist and animal consumers. And um, so in the coral reef system, we see, wow, there's this incredible diversity of consumers. There's so many different kinds of fishes. There's so many different kinds of invertebrates. But in fact, the actual existence of plants is really small. And the water is so translucent. You have a transparency up to 100 feet or more that you can see in tropical waters in, in, in reef areas. And so you say, well, there's no algae in the water and there aren't any plants growing around. So the, the big question is where are the primary producers? <clears throat> so one of the things is that uh, corals and sponges are both big filter feeders. They dominate the sea. So they're pretty much sucking out all of the plankton and things that are floating around in the water column. And that really contributes to water clarity. And so um, you probably have already guessed, and again, if we were in class, I'd say, okay, the tropical seas are virtually devoid of plankton. There's not a lot of marine plants going around. So where, where the heck are the primary producers? And, and I should also tell you guys that I've actually created this PowerPoint for my marine biology class. So it's a little bit more uh, 100 level-ish. Um, <laughs> don't usually put all these words out for you guys, but I know you you guys are all really sharp juniors and seniors that, that don't need this kind of spoon feeding. But since I'm doing this um, online, it probably helps a little bit too. All right, so here's just a reminder of what a typical food web can look like in other marine systems, not just terrestrial systems. This is an Antarctic food web. And of course, at the base of it, <clears throat> there is the algae primary producers, and then all of these other consumers, and in invertebrates like krill, and then fish, and birds, and seals, and whales, and they're all basically getting their production, getting their energy from basically the algae, which obviously gets its uh, food uh, energy through uh, using uh, solar energy. So 
in the tropical ocean, um, we know that <clears throat> where most of the algae actually exists is in an endosymbiotic relationship with the coral. They actually live within the coral tissue. You might recall that we talked about the zooanthellae uh, uh, quite a bit. A lot of people just call them zooks for short. Um, so these mutualistic endosymbiotic algae, and um, you'll probably uh, recognize, I'm going to go through this kind of quick because uh, we already talked a little bit about this in class, and I actually already showed you some of these slides before. You can see the endosymbiotic zoanthellae uh, in the tissue of a sea anemone, um, in uh, other cnidarians like uh, jellyfish, um, and in uh, hydra. There's uh, just a picture of some endosymbiotic uh, green algae. Actually, you may recall when we, when we talked about the protists um, that the zoanthellae are not green algae, but in fact are endosymbiotic um, uh, photosynthetic organisms that are uh, dinoflagellates. And in fact, dinoflagellates that have been modified enough that they no longer have their flagella. Okay, so here's a close-up on some coral polyps. You guys should probably recognize these as um, hexacorallia right away because, first of all, there are more than eight <laughs> tentacles. The tentacles are not pinnate, okay? And if you really want to take some time to count them, you should find that they're in multiples of six. And, of course, there's always a tentacle or two that can get bitten off, lost, or retracted. So if you might say, oh, there's not quite enough poly uh, tentacles here. <laughs> and also remember that um, all of these little knobby structures on these tentacles are where the cnidocytes exist. Like in any cnidarian, coral polyps have um, <clears throat> cnidocytes. And then you can see the base here. I really like this picture because you can see the mouth. I'm hoping that this pointer actually points it out pretty well to you. It sort of um, has that elongated look, just like a sea anemone. In a lot of ways, a coral polyp looks a lot like a sea anemone polyp, except they're a lot smaller, and they occur colonially. And we talked in class about what colonial means. Um, here's just some other photographs of looking at coral polyp tissue with their endosymbiotic algae, just for your uh, fun and amusement there. Um, you also have this PowerPoint um, on Blackboard, so you can go through it slower if you want to than I'm doing here on, the, on this little cast. So obviously we know we have a mutualism here. Whenever you have a mutualism, the question is who gets what? Okay, the zoanthellae are obviously providing organic compounds from the process of photosynthesis to the coral. And so uh, we might ask the question, well, what does the uh, zoanthellae get out of it? Well, they get a place to live. Uh, remember how we talked about there's all those fil filter feeders in the water column, um, sponges, corals, um, as well as other uh, organisms like microcrustaceans and other zooplankters that will feed on algae. So there's a lot of predators out there just waiting to swallow up algal cells. And by being embedded within coral tissue, they're definitely protected, protected from that kind of predation. Um, but along with that, along with just getting a place to live and therefore being distributed everywhere where the coral are distributed and getting protection from predators, um, it's really just quite the good life for the zoanthellae because they get a steady supply of nutrients from the coral's waste products. Well, what are the waste products? We know they've got photosynthesis going in one direction and then obviously cellular respiration produces carbon dioxide uh, at the end of, uh, of its process there, and that the carbon dioxide, and as you know, cellular respiration is a whole series of chemical reactions. It's not just a single one, but we look at a summary equation. We know that carbon dioxide is produced, and that obviously in order for photosynthesis to occur, um, we need carbon dioxide. So it makes for this um, incredibly efficient recycling of nutrients, and that's the key. That that recycling of nutrients and efficiency um, within the coral polyp tissue and the relationship between the zoanthellae and the coral animal itself is at the basis for why corals, uh, coral reefs are so incredibly productive and therefore can provide uh, so much to the base of the ecosystems that allows for this amazing biodiversity of life that exists at, at coral reefs. Um, and here's a nice little picture that shows the 
recycling. Again, it's a very simplistic picture here, but if this is a coral polyp tentacle and this green circle here is a single uh, zoanthellet al algal cell, we got sunlight coming in, photosynthesis is happening, obviously a lot of stuff going on in these white arrows, but oxygen gets produced sugars, lipids, once uh, sugars are produced, obviously other chemical reactions take place to produce all of the macromolecules, even proteins. Um, and so this isn't meant to show that just sugars and lipids are produced. It's meant to show that a lot of stuff is happening here. And that um, these byproducts of photosynthesis, the macromolecules, the sugars, uh, diffuse into the coral polyp tissue Right? And then, therefore, being an animal, like any other animal, is going to break down those sugars and other macromolecules through the processes of cellular respiration and produce carbon dioxide. Just like cellular respiration occurs in any cells, it's occurring uh, the same way in coral polyp cells. And then, of course, that carbon dioxide that's released doesn't fly off into the atmosphere like it, when it's exhaled by terrestrial organisms. Um, but it gets cycled back into, along with water, uh, diffuses back right into um, the algal cells so they have it readily available for photosynthesis. We don't often think of carbon dioxide as being a limiting factor in photosynthesis, but in fact, it, it definitely can be. And so by this, having the carbon dioxide right there, right available, diffusing right back in to the zoanthelae makes for an amazingly efficient system that, again, as I mentioned before, leads to the high productivity on the reef. And um, this is really, again, uh, just such an, an amazing and interesting aspect of, of coral reef systems. Um, so how does the reef itself get built? You know, you start with something that looks like a hydra. You've got these polyps hanging around. We know what um, a coral kind of looks like from looking at them in the marine tank. And you wonder how this enormous rocky reef, these huge cliffs, these boulders, these um, spurs and grooves that form within a reef system, how, how do they actually get made? And of course, the construction of a huge reef occurs over a really long period of time. So we're talking about not just hundreds and thousands of years, but you know, millennia, hundreds of thousands of years. And in fact, um, one of the claims of fame of um, Charles Darwin, obviously he's known for natural selection and evolution, but uh, it was actually Darwin who first uh, hypothesized about how coral reefs were um, composed and how the living organisms made the reef structure. And in fact, he hypothesized a volcanic origin um, for reef systems. But anyway, we, that, that, you ask me about that in class, we can talk more about uh, Darwin's contribution to coral reef construction theory. <clears throat> anyway, as we know, uh, calcium carbonate, which is this incredibly important substance, not just secreted by uh, corals, but made by many other invertebrates and protists, really important substance, um, gets deposited uh, by, by polyps that secrete it as a skeleton. Okay, and as we've also talked about, corals are colonial organisms, they're interconnected polyps, and they live embedded in this skeleton that they secrete. And here's a, here's a picture, on the left here we have a couple of polyps in a colonial fashion, and you can see that they have um, uh, secreted uh, some calcium carbonate layer. Here it's labeled as a skeletal calyx. So here's a polyp that's gone, and you can sort of see the septa and when you looked at those coral skeletons in class, you would have seen quite a bit of complexity to these coral cups um, that the polyp, the once living polyps used to inhabit. And on the right here, um, you can see that there's a layer after layer after layer of skeleton that was produced by the living tissue. And here's the living polyp on the top here. Um, which was all the way down here maybe years and years ago. Of course, not the same individual, <laughs> but some polyp secreting uh, within the, secreting the skeleton and um, <clears throat> then dying off, a new one takes its place, secreting another one, secreting another one. And you should watch the little video. I have coral video. Hopefully you can open it. If you can't, we'll try to figure out another way. But, um, and you can see a little bit of a 
cartoon animation of this process. But with enough time, you get this huge amount of rocky uh, material.